Greetings to everybody joining us today for the second session of CareMD's four-part physician training program. For those who missed last week's session, a recording is available now on the CareMD wiki. For attendees who do not have access to CareMD, the session is also available for viewing on the webinar section of the CareMD website. Please also refer to the ICD-10 section of the Care Wiki for answers to your questions. The wiki is accessible from within CareMD via the help link on the top right of your screens. We will continue to post all of your questions and their answers to you via the wiki to ensure that they are shared with everybody. We also found during the previous session that there isn't always enough time to take questions during webinars. As such, we'll be conducting a dedicated Q&A session starting next Thursday. These sessions will occur at 1 p.m and 6.30 p.m. Eastern to give everybody a ch chance to join in. While we wait for everybody to join and, and start off, please explore the GoToWebinar toolbar on your screens. You may use the questions segment of the toolbar to share your questions with us. I am Ken Edwards, Senior Billing Manager here at CareMD, and I will be your host for today. Our trainer, Dr. Williams, gradu graduated valedictorian from Palmer Chiropractic. He's a certified professional coding instructor, a medical compliance specialist, and a certified professional medical auditor. He's also one of the few clinicians to be ICD-10 certified by the AAPC, and we found him to be an excellent and thorough trainer. Good afternoon, Dr. Williams. Good afternoon, Ken. Thanks for having me. Well, Great for those of you who yours. attended part, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, for those of you who attended part one, you know that we are just building a foundation, um, and today we're going to talk about probably the most exciting topic in coding, and that is conventions and guidelines. Uh, many people who are not certified coders find conventions and guidelines to be uh, less sexy, if you will, than other aspects of healthcare. And so as such, it's often overlooked or neglected. And frankly, much of what I'm going to share with you in today's training are rules and, and guidelines that are true in ICD-9 today, but a few of them have changed. You need to be aware of not only old guidelines maybe you didn't even bother getting familiar with, but also new guidelines that have changed because of ICD-10. So as mentioned, this is part two of our, our workshop that we put together for you. I'm Dr. Gwilliam, and I'm the Chief Product Officer at find -A code which is a, an online encoding software that you might want to check out. Just to give you a little bit more of, of my background so you know who I am and why I'm qualified to teach this, I am a physician. I, I'm a provider, uh, like many of you. I have a background, though, in business and accounting which is probably why I was drawn to coding. All of my certifications that you see here are all generally coding and audit related. And as such, when I present to you how I think you should document for a certain thing or code a certain way, I'm trying to provide it to you from the perspective of someone who thinks like a clinician, but understands what the auditors and the coders and claims reviewers are trying to look for as well. And so that's part of our goal today is to cover guidelines so you can understand the rules that the third parties are applying to your claims when they take a look at them. The most important certification um, I want to point out is at the bottom there, it's underlined, it says that I'm a certified ICD-10 trainer through the American Academy of Professional Coders. And I just want to assure you that I went through a whole bunch of courses and, and paid a bunch of money and passed some tests. And uh, Frankly, I travel the country right now and uh, I go everywhere and teach providers and coders and billers how to get ready for ICD-10. And so, this is part two of what I hope you find to be a complete training um, or almost complete training for ICD-10. At the end, it's about some specialty specific information and how we're going to get that to you later. We can't possibly teach you everything you need to know for all specialties in healthcare in this presentation. And as such, there's going to be some other mini modules available to you through QMD on specialties. And, and, and part of that is because of the content today. So, just as an overview, part one that we did previously was IC10 Fundamentals and Navigation, where we talked about the structure of the code set and how it's set up and where it came from and what it's all about. Part two is these conventions and guidelines we'll discuss today. In other words, what are the rules of grammar that are applied to this new language? How do we know the proper way to speak in this language that we need to communicate in in order to get paid? Part three, which will be the next one that we cover in the next session, is how to find the code. Now, I know some of you wish I'd started with part three, because that's what you really want to know, is how do I pick the right code? And the truth is, you're going to be much more well-equipped to pick the right code if you paid attention to parts one and two. You really need this foundation to get to part three, which is critical. Part three is where the rubber meets the road, but you need to understand the basics first. And then part four, which we'll do in a few weeks, is documentation improvement. And I will give you strategies and examples there to help you work on documentation 
so that the providers can make sure that the things that they put in the record are the things that are coded correctly and you get paid and everyone lives happily ever after. So ICD-10 rules are broken up into, into a few different groups or types. Uh, essentially, I'd like to compare ICD-10 to a foreign language. If I speak English and I wanted to go ahead and learn how to speak Spanish, I could sit down and begin to study Spanish. The first thing I might want to learn is the rules of grammar. You know, if they create a sentence in Spanish, uh, what's the sequence of the adjective relative to the noun? Is there different punctuation? Is there uh, different voice and fluctuations? Is there gender agreement between the different words? And so I need to learn all of that before I can really get into uh, actually beginning to speak. And so we're going to start with conventions. These are the grammar rules for ICD-10. Essentially, we're going to talk about what does a certain abbreviation mean? What does it mean when an instruction is given? How should I interpret that? And we'll go over each of those. Now, the conventions kind of lay the, the groundwork. Step two here is the general coding guidelines, which are found in Section 1B in the official code set. General coding guidelines are rules that apply to all the codes in ICD-10. And they're around 70,000 codes, and so these are pretty universal. But sometimes there are specific rules that don't fit for every code, and they need to be specified for a particular uh, family of conditions. And that's where three comes in, and that's specialty specific coding guidelines for each chapter. There are chapters for different body systems or conditions in ICD-10. Uh, for example, there's a chapter just for respiratory problems. And if you look in Section 1C of the official guidelines, you will find specific guidelines just for respiratory conditions that can help you become more proficient with respiratory diagnosis coding and documentation, for that matter. Now, many of you on this uh, training on this call may not, be, may not care about respiratory codes because you don't use them. And that's fine. We're not going to actually get into the chapter-specific guidelines today. Those are going to be part of the specialty-specific trainings we'll make available to you later on after we've gone through all these fundamentals. So regardless, let's say you are a respiratory therapist, you need to know one and two for sure that you see on your screen. Uh, three is something you'll have to go after separately, and we'll provide it to you in a separate presentation. We don't have time to go over every chapter and its specific guidelines because uh, there's a lot of them. And so we're going to provide those to you in separate modules. And then the fourth one here, the fourth rules that you need to be aware of are those that show up in the tabular list. And last time we talked about the tabular list and how it's set up. It has columns with codes listed there. And sometimes right next to a code in the column, you'll see an instruction that says, for this code, you should always do it this way, or consider this other code, or never ever code it like this. And those instructions right in the column by the code itself, you need to understand they take precedence. They win. If they contradict the chapter-specific guidelines or the general conventions, that's okay. They are allowed to do that, and that means that you should follow those rules first and foremost. However, the conventions, general guidelines, and chapter-specific guidelines apply most of the time to most cases. So we're going to spend our time during this presentation looking at one and two on this screen, which is the conventions and then the general guidelines. And I'm not going to cover all of them with you. I have chosen um, the the greatest hits for this presentation. I'm going to share with you the ones I think matter the most, most of the time, for most of you. And so we're going to jump right in and begin with certain abbreviations that occur in ICD-10 that you need to understand. Uh, there is, in the ICD-10 conventions that are explained to us in the guidelines, it begins with NEC and NOS. Now these are abbreviations that are used throughout, um, throughout the code set and they're very common, and they're actually true in ICD-9 or 10, regardless of which code set you're using. NEC means not elsewhere classified or classifiable, and it's synonymous with the phrase other specified, or sometimes just other. This is used when the information in the medical record provides detail for which a specific code does not exist. For example, if the provider says the patient has this condition, and I look around and I can't find any code for that condition, then I would look for the code that says other specified or NEC. Now, NOS is different. NOS is not otherwise specified, and it's synonymous with unspecified. This is used when the information in the medical record is insufficient to assign a more specific code. So the provider might say the patient has a problem, but doesn't provide the detail that matches the code level of detail. And as such, they would be forced to choose the code that says NOS or unspecified. Let me sh show you some examples of this. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take some, some screenshots right out of the coding manual from the official code set from the tabular list um, these images are actually taken from the Instacode books, which uh, my company's helped create. So what we're looking at here is the block for other acute lower respiratory infections. 
which is J20 to J22. And I've chosen J20 as the category we want to check out. You'll notice that it's formatted as all capital letters, and there's a line above the beginning of the category. And every code that's followed within the J20 category um, will follow the rules you see on the left. And then on the right, I've shown you all the codes in the J20 category. Uh, it's cut off there, but J21 would be a new category, and it would have a line there to, de to designate. It's the beginning of a new category, and it might have some of its own rules. In this case, I've just highlighted two codes for you to look at there on the right. We have J208 and J209. J208 is NEC, or they chose to use the phrase other specified instead of NEC, so due to other specified organisms. This is acute bronchitis due to an other specified organism. You'll notice all the codes above that in the column on the right, say echovirus, rhinovirus, and a whole bunch of other things. If I know my patient has acute bronchitis, and I know what the cause is, what type of organism it is, and I look at the list of options available to me, and what my patient has is not one of those, then I choose J208, other specified. It means my record said what it was, what the organism was, but it wasn't one of the eight options available here, so I had to choose the eight as my fourth character to designate other. Now let's say that my record doesn't say what the organism was. For whatever reason, I don't know yet, I don't want to know, I don't bother documenting that, whatever. Then I would choose J209, which is unspecified acute bronchitis. In other words, I don't know or haven't specified what the organism is that may have caused it. And so J208 is when you are specific but no code is available that matches, and J209 would be when you're not specific and you don't offer that detail. And that's how you use other and unspecified or NEC and NOS. Here are some other conventions for you to take a look at. And, and by the way, I'll go through some examples where we'll look at what some of these mean and try to bring them all together for you. Um, the word includes is used within the column when you're looking at codes in the tabular list. And it's pretty self-explanatory. It basically further defines, clarifies, or gives examples of the content of a code category. And so it simply says what else is included in there. For example, if you look at the code for asthma, um, there is no code that designates allergy due or uh, allergic asthma or asthma due to allergies. Uh, but if you look under the includes, it says all the codes in this category, I believe it's G45, uh, includes uh, allergic asthma. So it's part of those. And you don't need to um, look and try to find a code that specifically states it because it's part of all the codes that, that pertain to asthma. You can also see inclusion terms, which are very similar. Um, you'll find a code sometimes, and underneath it, it'll just list a bunch of other terms. And these are other conditions that are assigned to that code. So again, the code description itself is critical, but if you find what your patient has, what you've been documented in the inclusion terms, then that works too. Um, the word and has special meaning in ICD-10, and so I want to make sure you understand how to apply the word and to code descriptions. The word and should be interpreted to mean either and or or when it appears in a title. And may help you to think of it as either or. Or, to make this more clear to you, I've got a picture of a headstone here. And you'll see that Paul and or Cecilia was buried in this plot. So it could be Paul and Cecilia. It could be Paul or Cecilia. Uh, we don't know, because and means and or. Okay, And hopefully the headstone will make you never forget. So let me give you an example of this, and we'll take a look at a specific code category and see what this means to us. We'll look at a few of these, these conventions. Um, you'll notice here I've chosen S33 as the category. This is the category for dislocation and sprain of joints and ligaments of lumbar spine and pelvis. And again, this is just a screenshot I pulled right out of the code set out of an Instacode coding book that my company produced. Uh, I highlighted the word and because it shows up three times in this particular description. And so some people will see dislocation and sprain and think that that's absolute and you have to have both. But in coding, the conventions let us know that and means and or. So if I use a code from the S33 category, a patient does not have to have a dislocation and a sprain. It's a dislocation and or a sprain. Also, it doesn't have to be the joints and the ligaments. It can be the joints and or the ligaments. And furthermore, it doesn't have to be the lumbar spine and the pelvis. It could be the lumbar spine and or the pelvis. So it helps to understand the, the meaning of these conventions so that you you use the codes properly. Now, we also see an instruction here that says includes. So it tells us that in this category, we see that it includes a bunch of other things, such as avulsions of joints and ligaments or traumatic ruptures of, or traumatic tears of joints and ligaments of the lumbar spine and the pelvis. And so these are things that are included within this category.
Now there are other guidelines you can see here, um, but we'll talk about those in a few moments. Code also excludes one and excludes two, and then the seventh character. We're going to get to those, um, but for now let's just see what we've we've got um, with this particular code. Now there are some other conventions that you need to be aware of uh, as well. There's actually several. We'll go through a few more. Uh, the conventions in the official guidelines explain to us etiology and manifestation as well, and they tell us that when there's a condition that has an etiology as well as a manifestation. The condition is sequenced first, followed by the manifestation code. And if we want to know what that means, we look up a code, and if it's an etiology code, it'll usually say, use additional, to explain there's another code that's the manifestation. If you were to look up the manifestation code, you will see an instruction that says code first, telling you that you should code first the etiology code. It also usually has in the description for the category for the manifestation code, it says, in diseases classified elsewhere. And that's usually a tip to you that you're looking at a manifestation as opposed to an etiology. To help you with this a little bit, in the alphabetic index, you'll see brackets used around the manifestation code to help you identify that it goes second uh, when you list the codes on a claim form. Now, if you're unfamiliar with these guidelines, you haven't seen them before, and frankly, if you're not a coder, you may not be familiar with them. That's okay. I'm going to show you some examples so you can see exactly how the code set explains this to you and helps you out. But in general, when you see use additional or code first, those instructions dictate the sequence of the codes, and they answer the question, which codes go first? How do I decide, uh, you know, which codes are more important? Which ones go before others? Well, sometimes in the tab your list, it will tell you use additional, meaning that one goes second, or code first, meaning that one goes first. Now, code also is also found in the tabular list, and it lets the coder know that there may be another code required to completely describe the condition. But the sequencing of those codes is up to you. It depends on the severity or the reason for the encounter. In general, whatever's more serious or whatever's the primary reason for the encounter should go first. And that's good advice because it's said that some payers only look at the first you know, or second codes that you list on a claim anyway. You might have eight or nine diagnosis codes, but they only use the first one or two to adjudicate your claim. As such, you should make sure that the first one or two are the best codes you have to offer. Whatever's most serious for the patient or whatever's the primary reason for the encounter should be listed first. So let's take a look at what this could look like within the code set. Um, I've got a couple of snippets here from the tabulist and one from the alphabetic index. If you would, take a look at the alphabetic index first on the right-hand side of your screen. Let's say that I had a patient with Parkinsonism, okay, and that patient also had dementia. So I would look up dementia and I would find in the alphabetic index here, uh, you notice that the first indent under dementia is with, and I scroll down and I find Parkinsonism and I highlighted there the code. It says, uh, dementia with Parkinsonism is G31.83, and then in brackets it lists another code, F02.80. And so what that tells me is the F02 code goes second. It's a manifestation code. Manifestation codes are included in brackets in the alphabetic index. And if you go to the left with me, I've chosen to look up the F02 category, which is for dementia and other in diseases classified elsewhere. Remember I said that manifestation codes often say diseases classified elsewhere in their description. And then you see there it says code first as the instruction, and then I've highlighted there what you should code first, dementia with Lewy bodies, which is synonymous with Parkinsonism, G3183. In other words, if I was looking up dementia in the tab of your list, it would tell me to code first the, the disease that led to the dementia. Dementia. In this case, we're going with Parkinsonism, G3183, or Lewy bodies are present. Um, if I had gone through the alphabetic index and looked up dementia, I would have been given the same instructions. G3183 goes first, and the F code for the dementia goes second. Um, and so understanding these conventions and guidelines will be critical to your ability to put the codes in the right sequence, the right order. Now, if you're the provider and you have coders who work with you or for you, Hopefully, they're familiar with these rules, because these aren't new to ICD-10 necessarily. Um, and they should be able to apply them to help you get the right sequence of the codes. The thing is, these coders and billers who work for you can only code it if you've documented it. And if you understand the rules of the codes, then you might know how to document it better so that you can provide them with what they need to pick the right codes. And again, we'll, we'll focus in on documentation more specifically in part four of this, this workshop. Now, Excludes is another convention that is really critical for your understanding of ICD-10. In ICD-9, you could look up a code in the tab of your list, and it might say excludes, and it would list another code. In ICD-10, they decided to expand upon that and create two types of excludes. There's excludes 1 and excludes 2. Excludes 1 is pretty much the same as it was in ICD-9, and that is 
the conditions listed underneath that heading cannot be used on the same claim as the code that you're looking at. So they're not coded. They're mutually exclusive of each other. For example, if a patient has no left hand, they were either born without that left hand or it was lost after they were born. And there's codes for congenital absence of a, of a hand and codes for acquired absence of the hand. And those codes will be excludes one. They will be mutually exclusive of each other because you cannot diagnose a patient with both congenital absence and acquired absence of a limb at the same time. It's one or the other. So you'll find the excludes one to help you understand that those codes don't get to go together. Now excludes two is a little different and it's new to ICD-10. It means not included. And, and frankly, I wish they had said not included instead of excludes two because it would make more sense to me. If you look at excludes two any time in the code set, you should just consider it to mean not included. And that means that whatever conditions are listed under the excludes two heading, they are not part of the condition you're looking at. Um, they might be coded in addition in order to properly completely describe the case. So let's take a look at some examples of this. Um, but first, let me give you some clarification on how you can think about these terms and use them to help you pick the right codes. Excludes one means mutually exclusive, and I think it helps when you see it to consider these codes instead. So it helps to identify codes you could use instead of the one you're looking at. Some people like to think that the one in excludes one means you can only use one of these codes. Excludes two is not included, and some people like to think it means use two or more, potentially. You, you may, you don't have to. But I like to say it means consider these codes in addition. So excludes one means I could use these codes instead, and excludes two means I could use these codes in addition to the code that I'm planning to use. So we're going to go back to our dislocation and sprain of joints and ligaments of the lumbar spine and pelvis in the tabular list. And we've previously looked at the use of the word and and the includes notes, but let's go down and look at code also, excludes one and excludes two now. For this group of codes, for the S33 category, we are told to code also any associated open wound. So if we want to, we could add an open wound code to this, this S33 code. But if the patient didn't have an open wound, then we wouldn't need to. And if we want to decide which one goes first, we simply list first whatever is the primary reason for the encounter or whatever is more severe. When we go down to excludes one, we see a couple of codes listed there. These codes are mutually exclusive and may not appear on the same claim, um, and we should consider them instead. For example, if you look at the one under excludes one that says, it's uh, obstetric damage to pelvic joints and ligaments, 071.6. That that means is if I have a patient with damage to their pelvic ligaments, I, I might first look at S33 because that's the code for dislocation and sprain of the pelvis. But uh, it turns out the excludes one note indicates to me that if that's the case and it's due to an obstetric problem, then I need to go to 071.6. And that is in a different chapter for the obstetric codes where I would find it. And I'd have to go to that code and look up all the guidelines for that one. So I would use that one instead. It's a better code if there's an obstetric complication. If it's some other uh, generally traumatic explanation for the sprain of the pelvis, then I would stick with S33. Now if I go down and look at the excludes two note here, excludes two means not included, or when I see it, I want to think, consider these codes in addition. They may be necessary in order to completely describe this case. So let's take a look at both of the codes that are listed here. The first one is dislocation and sprain of joints and ligaments of hip, S73. What that's telling me is that the hip is not included in the pelvis because S33 includes the pelvis. It's listed as part of the description. But the hip is not part of the pelvis. And if I want to describe that my patient also sprained some ligaments of their hip, then I need to consider in addition the S73 code because it was not included. So excludes two means not included or consider these codes in addition. Furthermore, I can look at the next code there. It says strain of muscle of lower back and pelvis, S39.01. What that's telling me is that the strain of the lower back and pelvis muscles is not included, because excludes two means not included. It's not included in the S33 codes. So if my patient has a strain of the muscles, I need to code that in addition in order to properly describe the case. Now, for those of you who are familiar with strain and sprain codes in ICD-9, you recognize that they were there was a single code and it lumped them together. You would use 847, 848 codes and you would say, you would use those codes and it would include sprain as well as strain. The strain was listed under the includes list, but now it's listed under the excludes too, which is not included. And if I want to report both a sprain and a strain on the same patient, I need to report two separate codes to completely document that. And it may help you to remember that strains appeal, apply to muscles, whereas sprains apply to ligaments. And so there should be objective findings to support both. So I'd like to step back for a moment and try to apply a few of these guidelines to help you find the right code. The real question is, 
if I've chosen a code, how do I know if it's right? And I'm telling you that understanding these guidelines and rules will help you know if you have the right code. And if you have the right code, then your claim shouldn't be denied. And if your claim isn't denied, you should get paid and everyone lives happily ever after. So that's why these guidelines are so important. The code that I want to use as an example here is M25652, which is stiffness of left hip, not elsewhere classified. And I found this picture here of a poor girl with a stiff hip. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this code for a stiff left hip and we're going to break it down and see if the guidelines that we just learned or, or the conventions impact the code we've chosen and change our mind or help us find a better code. So that's our plan here. You'll notice I highlighted here on the left, uh, this is snipped right out of the book, right out of the Instacode um, code book. I've snipped out the M25652 code and I've highlighted the word left. You'll notice that in our book, the way we've listed the description is it's incomplete. We've, we've, we've minimized it for you. So all we give you is left. So I highlighted the rest of the description that's relevant to this code, and that is stiffness of hip not elsewhere classified. You'll see that applies to the M2565, um, but M2565 is not a complete code. I could never put that on a claim. And the way we've depicted that here is it's not in bold. Okay? So what you see listed there that's in bold is a complete code that could appear on a claim, or it's a valid code anyway. It doesn't mean it's payable, but it means it's valid. But M2565 is not a valid code, and it's not payable either because it's not a complete code. You need to have six characters. So what we're going to do to try to figure out if there's any conventions or guidelines that impact our code selection, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the last character of the code, and we're going to remove it. And we're going to look for rules. And then we're going to remove the next character and look for rules. Then we're going to remove the next character until we get all the way back to the M, which is the first character of the code. So the first step here is to get rid of the two. And when I remove the two, you can see that it changes what I've highlighted here on the left so that it's just M2565. It's got a hyphen there, which means there's more characters, and it's not in bold, which means I can't use it on a claim. And there's nothing else here that changes my mind. I should point out one other feature, though, of this particular coding manual, and that is that the ICD-9 equivalent is listed here. And as far as I know, I haven't seen any other publisher that does this for you. Um, and so in the Instacode ICD-10 books that my company creates, we've listed the ICD-9 equivalent right under the ICD-10 category whenever we could find one. So the equivalent for this one would have been 71955. So this is considered what's called a subcategory, which is something I went over a bit in the previous presentation. We can then go back a step further, because there's nothing else here that changed my mind or influenced my code selection. So I'm going to remove the 5, which is the final character of what I'm looking at, and I'm going to go back to M256. It takes me to the top of the column here. I'm looking at the tabular list. I'm looking at the top of the column, and I see here uh, M25.6 and then a hyphen, meaning it's not complete. I've got to add more characters. This is for all the stiffness of joint codes. And if you look below, you'll notice that the fifth character for all the codes below adds a specific joint. So M2561 is the shoulder. M2562 is the elbow. M2563 is the wrist, and so on. Um, nonetheless, the thing that's critical here is I'm going to zoom in on this, and I want to show you under M256, if I zoom in, you can see that there's some excludes one notes now. Now this is where things start to get interesting. So this excludes one notes. These, these notes or these rules apply to all the codes that we go with M256. My code was at the bottom of the column on that page, but these rules still apply. And it says here that I should consider instead or the mutually exclusive code for stiffness of joints is ankylosis of joint and contracture of joint, M246 and M245. What that's telling me is I could consider these codes instead because they're mutually exclusive. And if my patient has stiffness of joint that's actually due to ankylosis, then I should be using these other codes. Or if their stiffness of joint is actually due to contracture, then I should use this other code. So you can see how the code set can assist me in becoming more correct in the codes I have chosen. If my note designates that the patient's stiffness is actually due to uh, contracture or ankylosis, then I should be using these other codes, and it would be more accurate. Now, I can go back a step further and move to where there's only three characters. The three character level is called the category, and you'll notice it's in all capital letters, and there's a line above it to designate that we're at the beginning of a category in the Instacode tabular list. Uh, I've got here a bunch of excludes two notes that applies to this entire category. And this rule applies to every code that begins with M2, M25, even though it's not even on the same page. And so if we look at excludes two, we are reminded that excludes two means not included or I should consider these codes in addition. And so I see here seven or eight different things I should consider in addition. For example, take a look at uh, difficulty in walking, R26.2. Since my patient had stiffness of the hip, my patient might also have difficulty in walking. And what this instructional note is telling me is 
that the difficulty in walking is not assumed to be part of that code. It's not included. Exclusive to me is not included. And if my patient has difficulty walking, in addition to stiffness of their left hip, then I must code that R262 code in addition. And that would be necessary to completely describe what's been documented. Or let's say that I take an X-ray of the stiff hip and I see calcification of a bursa. Well, it's listed here under the excludes 2, so I would code calcification of a bursa in addition to the stiff hip because it's not included, and it would be okay to add it as an additional code. I can go back a step further to the beginning of the block. So the, a block is a range of categories. We were at the category for M25, but now we can go back to the beginning of the block. And M20 to M25 is the block that, that our category belongs to. And we'll notice at the beginning of the block, which is formatted with these two lines and the capital letters so it's easy to spot, uh, we see there that I've highlighted excludes two joints of the spine. So again, we apply the rules that we just learned, and excludes two means not included or consider these in addition. And what it's telling me is that joints of the spine are not included in this block for other joint disorders. The spine has their own block, which is M40 to M54. And I to go over there and find a code for that if I need to in order to completely uh, select the codes that match the documentation for this particular case. Now I can go back one step further from the beginning of that block to the beginning of the chapter. When I move to the beginning of the chapter, you'll see that um, there's a bunch of rules that apply to every code that starts with the letter M. All of the M codes have certain rules. There's a note there that says you should use external cost codes if applicable. There is an exclusive two note that says uh, I should consider these codes in addition because they're not included. And since this is an entire chapter, if you take a look at that list, you'll see that what's, what's listed here is very broad. In fact, it's whole chapters. They're saying the chapter for um, congenital malformations is not included within the codes here for musculoskeletal problems. The musculoskeletal codes are chapter 13. They begin with the letter M. But if the patient also has a congenital malformation, then I would code that in addition because that excludes two means it's not included in this chapter. Or if you look down towards the bottom of that list of excludes two, it says neoplasms. If my patient has a cancer or a tumor, and maybe it affects the bones or the joints that I'm looking at, I have to code that tumor in addition because it's under the excludes two list. It's not included within this chapter. If the patient has a, a condition that has to do with neoplasms, I need to go elsewhere to find that code, and I would consider adding it if it was relevant to the case and it affected the treatment. You can also see here, see guidelines, 1C 20.A.14 semicolon B. What that's leading you towards is in the official guidelines, there are some chapter-specific rules for this code. We're not going to get into those in this presentation, but there may be something there that you need to know about for this chapter, I should say. Those are the chapter-specific guidelines for, uh, there are some rules there that affect some of the codes in this chapter. So let's go back to my code. Let's go back to M25652 and just see what we've learned. Okay, so here we are looking back at how the code appeared originally in the tabular list. And we see um, very very nicely that uh, M25652 sits down there by itself. It says it's the left, and the rest of the description is available up at the subcategory level, stiffness of hip. So everything seems fine. But what we learned from this was that the in-column instructions for this, this code appeared in many places as we worked our way backwards. There was no exclusions right by the code. I found it in three other places, and those changed or could have influenced my code selection. They could have made me choose a different code or use an additional code to make more accurately reported. So my tip for you is this. Pretend like you already know how to find the code, and once you find it, work backwards to find the relevant instructional notes. In the next um, part or the next module of this training next week, we will talk to you about how to find the code and work forwards to get to it. But right now, I'm just telling you how to work backwards from a code to make sure it's right. Okay? We'll work forwards next time. There are a few other conventions to review with you, um, and then we'll get into some general coding guidelines that apply to the entire code set. We see here uh, the definition of some terms that are used frequently throughout the code set. The words with and without are defined, well, with is defined as meaning associated with or due to. Now, if you have documentation that says patient has such and such, and you don't specify whether it's with or without, the default is the without. So it is okay to not document, even though the code has information that says without something. It's okay to do that, but I don't think you should do that. I think that that is important um, for you to document simply because the codes offer it. In case you're wondering why I pictured Barbie here, it's, it's because on the left I have Barbie without makeup, and on the right is Barbie with makeup, in case you wanted to know how she looked. There she is. So let me give you an example of this. Um, I have a code from the nervous system chapter, which is chapter 6 of ICD-10, 
the G code. G47.1 is hypersomnia, somebody who sleeps too much. Uh, I'll tell you what, that wasn't me today. I got up too early. Uh, but if you look, I highlighted a couple of codes. Uh, G4711 is idiopathic hypersomnia with long sleep time, and G4712 is idiopathic hypersomnia without long sleep time. So you can see frequently you'll find codes grouped together, and you'll find one that says with, and the next code will be the exact same thing but without. And so just be accustomed and understand that you can choose the without as default without having to state it or document it. But if the codes offer that, then you might as well document it and make it clear and make it available. Those are all the conventions I want to review with you. There are a few others, and you might want to take the time to read Section 1A of the official um, guidelines to find those conventions and review them. Um, but those are the ones I think are most important for you to know right now, and, and I wanted to be concise. I'm not giving you a complete overview of all there is to know about IC10. I'm giving you the stuff that's going to help 90% of you 90% of the time. And so I've concentrated this. It's action-packed. Um, so the second level we need to look at for rules is the general coding guidelines. Section 1B of the official guidelines contain a couple pages of, of general guidelines that apply to all the codes, and, uh, and so we need to take a look at some of those. And so we're going to start with um, Section 1B3, which says you should always code to the highest level specificity. In ICD-9, that's up to five digits, and in ICD-10, it's up to seven. In other words, if you look up a code and you see that it has seven characters, and you look at the seventh character, and you're like, I don't understand that. I don't know what that means. I'm just going to give them six characters. That is not okay. The guidelines tell us if seven characters are available for a code, you must use all seven. You don't have the prerogative to drop characters from codes just because you don't understand or don't like it or didn't document something. Um, in that case, you would end up with an unspecified code. And so in ICD-9, for example, if you saw a code that had uh, five characters available and you only used three of them, that would get denied. And the guidelines tell us you have to use all the characters that are available. Uh, we're also told in the official guidelines that you should list first the ICD-9 or 10 code before the diagnosis, condition, problem, or other reason for the encounter or visit shown in the medical record to be chiefly responsible for the services provided. So let me restate that. You should list first the diagnosis code that is the main reason for the visit or the main reason for those services. And so when people ask me, how do I know which codes are the most important, or how do I know which codes to list first? Well, you should list first whatever's the main reason for the visit. Okay, well, now we also saw guidelines that say code first or use additional code to help you decide which ones go first. But in general, you should always list first the code that is the main reason for the visit. And that, that's logical. It makes sense. We're also given some rules about signs and symptoms. Now, signs and symptoms are are a description. Basically, signs and symptoms are things you can get from the patient that they report to you, and they don't necessarily describe the patient's specific condition. Um, that's up to the clinician to figure out. The clinician gathers information about the signs and symptoms, and then conducts tests and whatnot, and comes up with a diagnosis. So we are told that it's okay to report signs and symptoms or use sign and symptom codes when a related definitive diagnosis has not been established or confirmed by the provider. So examples of these in ICD-9 are the 780s to 790s. But in ICD-10, these codes are codes that begin with the letter R. Is it okay to report symptom codes? Sure. You can report them when you don't have a more definitive diagnosis that's been established. But many times you'll find that the symptoms are included within the established diagnosis code, and it's not necessarily to necessary to report them separately. Let's take a look at some examples of some symptom codes straight from Chapter 16 in the code set. Now these codes will start with the letter R, and if you look at the top left, you see I've chosen the category for pain in throat and chest. It's a symptom. Right? And on the right, I've got symptoms and signs involving emotional state, R45. So I just chose two different categories to share with you, just some, as some examples. Let's say if my patient has pain in their throat, I would use R07.0 on the left. It has some excludes notes to tell me about some more specific codes I would use instead. So if they actually have a chronic sore throat or a sore throat that's acute, I could use some more specific codes to describe that. They're under the excludes one instructions. You can also see things like chest pain, precordial pain, and so on. The thing is, reports of pain are simply symptoms. They're not definitive diagnosis of the patient's condition. And as such, they are considered symptom codes. If we take a look at some of the examples on the right, you have your um, emotional state code. So let's say R45.2, unhappiness. Maybe they, um, the patient comes in and says, I need some help. I'm just sad all the time. I think it's because I've, I've got my insurance plan and I've got this coverage, but I don't get it. It costs too much. It never covers what I need it to, and I'm just sad all the time. 
you could use that code to describe that particular description of their symptoms. I don't know if the insurance company would pay for that, and they might take offense, but nonetheless, that's one way you could use that code. Now, what if your patient actually has depression? You can diagnose depression, and you do not need to diagnose the symptom of R45.2, unhappiness, because unhappiness is included in depression, and it's not necessary. Unhappiness is a symptom code, and depression is an F code, which is more definitive. And if you have the ability to diagnose that more definitive diagnosis, then you don't need to worry about the symptom code any longer. And that's further clarified for us in the guidelines, section 1B7 of the official guidelines. Let us know. Signs and symptoms that are associated routinely with the disease process should not be assigned as additional codes. There's no reason to. For example, I've got the code for jaw pain here, R68.84. That's the code for jaw pain. And the excludes one note tells me, you don't code this along with joint arthralgia, M2662. Temporal mandibular joint arthralgia, or TMJ for short, is a condition where the jaw has some problems and it hurts. And there's no reason to also code the R code, which says the jaw hurts, if you've got a condition that explains that symptom. Now, we are told, though, in the next paragraph of the guidelines, that additional signs and symptoms that may not be associated routinely with the disease process should be coded if they're present. So here's another example that I kind of made up. What if the patient comes in and they sprain their neck in a car accident, and they report nausea? And you determine the nausea is not due to some other head injury or to food poisoning or anything like that. You just know they have nausea. And you have a definitive diagnosis of what they really have, which is a sprain of their neck. But uh, the nausea is relevant and important, so you report it in addition. It's OK to report that symptom, because it's not routinely associated with the sprain of the neck in this case. And so it may not be necessary to report the symptom code when you have a definitive diagnosis uh, that includes it, but it may be necessary when it's not included. Furthermore, the guidelines let us know that, and this is in section four of the official guidelines, that you should not code diagnoses that are documented as probable, suspected, questionable, rule out, or working diagnosis, or anything that indicates uncertainty. So if your provider lists uh, a bunch of differential diagnoses and say, well, the patient could have one of these three or four things, that's all well and good, and that should be documented. That's good documentation. But it doesn't mean that those things should be coded. In fact, this guideline says if they don't know for sure what it is yet, you can't code it. And that might be a good example of when you code the symptoms. If you don't know for sure what the patient has, then you would you can't code it, even if you have a good suspicion. And if you are you are very confident you're correct, and you're like, you know what, I know that's what this is, but you aren't completely certain, then maybe you shouldn't use a, a code that indicates certainty. You should use a symptom code. Okay, and that's just what the code said is letting us know we should do. For example, you might use a symptom code to say, I need to order, you know, the patient's complaining of cough and has fever. Those are symptom codes. I'm going to use that code to justify the ordering of a chest x-ray to look for pneumonia. And if I do a chest x-ray and decide to have pneumonia, and now I'm certain of it, then I would no longer report the cough and the fever. I would only report the pneumonia code, because now I'm certain, and I've got a definitive diagnosis. There's another guideline I find interesting that I think I should mention to you, and that is it assists in helping you understand whether or not you should report comorbidities. Uh, section 4, paragraph K of the guideline says you should code all documented conditions that coexist at the time of the encounter or visit that and require or affect patient care, treatment, or management. So what that tells me is I should report anything that affects my patient's care. So if I'm treating, uh, let's say I'm treating uh, an injury of their leg and they have diabetes, well, it may be that injury doesn't heal very quickly because of the diabetes. Um, or the diabetic neuralgia complicates the treatment of this ankle sprain or fracture. And as such, I could report the diabetes as something that affects my patient care or management, even if I'm not the one who's treating their diabetes. Pregnancy can also affect a lot of conditions, and it can complicate the treatment or management of a condition, and you might want to report it. There is a code specifically designated for this purpose. It's C33.1, and it's pregnancy incidental, um, which is kind of fun because I wonder if they're ever going to create a code that's pregnancy accidental, So I think that happens sometimes too. Uh, nonetheless, pregnancy incidental would be what you'd report for a patient who has pregnancy, but you're not treating the pregnancy or managing it. You're treating something else, and you want the third party to know about the pregnancy as a complication or just to know that it's incidental. Same thing with cancer. You might, not be, you might not be the oncologist, but the patient's cancer may affect how you manage your patient, so you may want to report that. A few other general guidelines I need to go over with you as we uh, get closer to the end of this, this presentation. Uh, acute and chronic. We are told that if a patient has an acute condition at the same time as a chronic condition, it's the same thing, then you list the acute one first. For those of you who are math nerds may appreciate that I've given you a bunch of acute angles here. Right, acute condition, acute angles. They're less than 90 degrees. It makes them acute. Some people don't appreciate that joke because it's kind of obtuse, and, and that's all right. Let me give you an example of this. Um, here is the code that I've highlighted towards the bottom, J01. 
there we go, J01.0 is acute maxillary sinusitis. And the excludes note for the J01 says, excludes two chronic sinusitis. In other words, acute sinusitis or acute sinus infections do not automatically include chronic sinus infections within the code. And if your patient has both, you need to code them both. And the guidelines further told us that the chronic one goes second. If the patient has both acute and chronic sinus infections at the same time, the chronic one goes second. The excludes two note just reminded me that the chronic one is not included and I should consider in addition. And the official guideline of acute versus chronic lets me know which one goes first, which is the acute. Also, there are a few guidelines for combination codes. Combination codes are used to classify two different diagnoses or a diagnosis with an associated manifestation or a diagnosis with a complication. So some people say, gosh, I'm going to need a lot of codes in IC10 because there's so many of them. Well, sometimes you'll find an IC10 code that includes uh, a secondary process or a complication, and now you'll need one code to describe everything. Let me show you what I mean by looking at some of the diabetes codes. It, the diabetes codes are pretty much all combination codes in ICD-10, and that wasn't the case in ICD-9. On the left, I've got a list of a real, some common diabetes codes. 250 uh, is diabetes. 2505 is diabetes with ophthalmic manifestations, so with eye complications. And 25051 is diabetes with ophthalmic manifestations type 1, not stated as uncontrolled. Uh, if my patient has an ophthalmic manifestation, I would have to go and code it separately in ICD-9. I would go look up the code for diabetic cataract, 36641. And so at the bottom left, you see the proper way to code for someone who has diabetes with a cataract. There's two codes. But on the right, you see how it appears in ICD-10. Your E08 to E13 is the, the block of codes for diabetes, and E10 is the category for type 1 diabetes. E10.3 is type 1 diabetes with ophthalmic complications. And E10.36 is the, it specifies the type of ophthalmic complication. So that final code, E10.36, includes all the information necessary to completely describe my patient's case. And I needed two codes previously, but now it's a combination code. It has the diabetes along with the cataract in a single code. There are a few other guidelines here um, that we need to go through still. Sequela. The word sequela is defined in the official code set as late effects. Uh, in IC9, they use the term late effects more frequently. Now they use the term sequela. It is defined as a residual effect after the acute phase of an illness or injury is terminated. Great example, the patient has a stroke, and the stroke is uh, gone. So the patient comes in for treatment for paralysis. They want to get some rehab to help restore movement in that area. You're not treating the stroke anymore because it's gone, but it caused the paralysis. So you can report both codes and you would report the paralysis, and then you would report the cerebral infarction sequela code to make it clear that it is the cause of the thing you're actually treating. We're told to code first the thing you're treating, and second, the illness or injury that led to it, and that'll be the code with a sequela indicator, which is a seventh character we'll examine a little bit later. Never code the acute phase of an illness or injury with a sequela. The guidelines also let us know what to do if a patient has impending or threatened conditions. So if you have a patient and you think that they are, you expect them to have a, a heart attack, um, we are told to code the confirmed diagnosis um, if you have it, but if it's impending or threatened, then you can code it if it appears in the index. And I've listed here the only codes that you can use for impending or threatened. So if you suspect that your patient has or is going to get, let's say, uh, you know, a throat, an infection in their throat, you, there's no way to code for that because when you look under impending and threatened in the alphabetic index, it only lists these six or seven codes you see here. These are the only things that you can code as impending or threatened. So, so take a look at the list or go to your alphabetic index when you're deciding, well, can I code it if it's impending? Uh, no, you have to wait for it to happen to code it otherwise um, to, to code the more specific version of the condition. A few other guidelines. Laterality. Um, if the condition is bilateral and there's no bilateral code, then you must list the left and right codes separately. Most of the time, the six characters was used to indicate laterality, and it's going to be a one or a two. One for right, two for left. That's not always true. In many cases, you'll see the four and the five used for right and left. Um, and a lot of codes have bilateral as an option, and that's usually the number three, but sometimes the number six, sometimes both. If the laterality is not specified in the documentation, then you must code the unspecified option, and the unspecified one in that case would probably get denied because there's not really any good reason for you to, to not specify laterality. Uh, for example, if you see on the left here, we have some uh, ear infection codes. Uh, you notice I highlighted the bilateral option. The one and the two is right and left ear, but the three is bilateral. But if you go to the right, for a lot of your extremity conditions, of the, so conditions of the arms and legs, almost all of those you have to specify right and left and you don't have a bilateral option. And so if the patient has both, uh, if it is a bilateral condition, then you're supposed to list the right and left codes separately. 
and that is very common for extremity issues, you often see bilateral coats for eyes and ears. Now this comes into play when you want to get paid properly. Let's say that your patient has transient synovitis of their shoulders, and you specify the right shoulder and the left shoulder with two separate coats, and I've got them listed here in blue, what I might show, put on a claim form. Remember that x-ray codes, you can specify laterality with the mod modifiers RT and LT, and as such, it's important for you to make sure that your procedure codes match the laterality specified in your your diagnosis codes, and you didn't have to do that in ICD-9, but now you need to keep, stay, keep close watch and make sure that your diagnosis codes do match your procedure codes. Another very important guideline for you to understand is the use of the X placeholder and the seven character extensions. The ICD-10 uses the X placeholder in positions four, five, or six when the seventh character needs to stay in a certain position, and, and maybe the code has no sixth character or fifth character, and we're told to drop in an X in that case. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, let's say I've got a patient with a traumatic closed non-displaced transverse fracture of the left patella, broken knee. This is actually a real x-ray of a, one of my colleagues. She slipped on the ice this last winter and snapped her kneecap in half, uh, her kneecap right in half. When she comes in for the first visit, we would use the A for initial encounter. When she comes in for a subsequent encounter for follow-up treatment, we would use, we would report that as a subsequent encounter and use the D as the seventh character. If it was, she was returning later for pain in the knee, we could explain the cause of the pain of the knee by using the M code for pain of the knee first, and then the S code explain that the, it was a fracture with an S at the end for sequela, saying that we're not treating the fracture anymore, it's gone, it's healed, but she's coming in because of something that was caused by that fracture. So we need two codes to describe that with a sequela. So let me further define the A, the D, and the S, which are the most common seven characters you're gonna come across in ICD-10. The A indicates the initial encounter. And the guidelines tell us that initial encounter doesn't necessarily just mean the first visit. Initial encounter actually means every encounter while the patient is receiving active treatment. The initial encounters for the phase of care while the patient is receiving active treatment, which could be treatment by the same or a different physician. So if it takes multiple encounters in order to um, correct this problem, you might use the A for multiple encounters. The D is used for subsequent encounters for when you determine the patient to be in the healing or recovery phase of care, such as aftercare and follow-up. And the S or for sequela is when the complication is now what you're treating and that particular condition is resolved. So, for example, someone breaks their arm, they come in for an, uh, getting it manipulated, that would be the A. They come back two weeks later for an x-ray to make sure it's healing properly, that would be the D. And they come back a year later for pain in the arm and I would use the S. I would co first code the arm pain and then secondarily I would code the arm fracture with the S or sequela at the end to make sure that I described properly uh, what the patient uh, really has and, and the explanation for it. So let me take you through some, to help you think through the application of the A, D, and S. The A would be used if the patient's receiving active treatment, right? So I'm going to go ahead with the A. What if they're in the middle of a treatment plan and you haven't corrected the problem yet? I believe that you might still use the A even though it's not just the first visit. It might be the second, third, or fourth visit, especially with soft tissue and rehab type conditions. What if the patient's now stable? Well, I think in those cases, you might report the D for subsequent encounter because they're considered stable. They're in aftercare now. What about if they're receiving supportive care? I believe supportive type care is considered a D for aftercare or follow-up. The healing and recovery phase is specifically listed as what's appropriate for the D as the seventh character. And finally, if they're being treated for a complication that's a direct result of something else, I would use the S for sequela. Okay, I have a few more guidelines for you. An unspecified code, the guidelines let us know about unspecified codes. Um, and they tell us that you can report unspecified codes, feel free, but only do it when it is the code that most accurately reflects what's known about the patient's encounter. So you hear a lot of, about, out there about don't use unspecified codes, they're bad news. Well, we expect payers to deny them. Uh, Medicare let us know they won't necessarily deny unspecified codes as long as your specific Medicare guideline that tells you you have to get the right code. And for many of us, we do. So it really pays to find a specific code. We're also told it's not okay to select a code that hasn't been supported by the documentation, and it's not okay to conduct medically unnecessary diagnostic testing just to find a better code. That's not all right. When it comes to unspecified codes, you really need to make sure that you do not select them unnecessarily or too frequently. So find the unspecified codes you think you're gonna use, GEMS map them to the ICD-10 code and look around for other options within that code's category to see if there's anything better. For example, if you look at what I've chosen here, I've got congenital deformities of the hip, 
Q65.00, that's unspecified. So the question is, well, how can I make it more specified? And the answer is, I need to specify right or left hip. And I believe that in pretty much every clinical circumstance, you know right from left, and you're, you're able to identify that. If your provider doesn't document right or left, or the patient doesn't know if it's the right or left that they're complaining about, then you've got some issues. But in general, you use the one for right, the two for left, and when you see an unspecified code, you can almost always find something better. Only use the unspecified code if it's the best information you have. If you go down to Q652 at the bottom of, of the screen there, maybe I'd use that when I know their hip is dislocated, but I don't know which side. Well, the thing is, again, I don't know when I would not have the side. So stay away from unspecified codes as much as possible, and make sure your documentation includes the extra detail that you should use when, uh, when appropriate. So what we've just done um, is we've gone over a whole bunch of coding conventions and then the general coding guidelines that sort of are rules that apply to all the codes. And what we're not going to do today is go over the chapter specific guidelines. There are lots and lots of them and as such we're going to break those up into separate modules for you and make those available to you and, and QRMD will talk to you about how to make those available but find a code and Instacode which are my companies will produce those for you and make them available through QRMD and so if you are a cardiologist or a respiratory therapist or you uh, are an orthopedist you're going to have another module available to you just for your specialty to help you with the chapter specific guidelines you need to be aware of and so we'll make those available to you a little later on. And I want to remind you that step four here, the guidelines found in the tab your list always win and take precedence. They trump the other guidelines if they contradict them. And so those are right in the column with the code itself. And so that is everything I have for you today. I'm going to turn the time over to Ken, who is going to just cover a few more things with you before we wrap things up here today. Go ahead, Ken. Great. Thank you, Dr. Williams. That was a very, very detailed and very insightful webinar. I think that was very useful. And I really improve my understanding of the coding conventions. Attendees, if you would please note that we're able to take your questions through the questions segment of the GoToWebinar uh, toolbar, and these questions we will compile together and list answers to as well uh, for our Q&A session that we'll have with you separately. For those who missed last week's session, uh, please note on your website uh, or on the screen, there is a view showing you the Cure Wiki. This is the QRMD Wiki page that's accessible to you from within QRMD via the help link on the top of your screens. And the videos from each one of these training sessions, including other videos applicable to ICD-10, uh, you know, specific items within the QRMD application will be accessible to you there. We're also posting answers to all of your questions within that link so that everybody can share and see what questions are being asked and what answers are being presented um, in one go. So we're going to uh, we, we recommend that you start looking at those sessions or at those videos and the Q&As as soon as possible. Um, in regards to those Q&As, uh, one other item that we are going to start uh, doing dedicated Q&A sessions from next Thursday. These sessions will occur at 1 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time so that you can pick the session that suits you best. And we'll do four sittings so that we can accommodate everybody during these sessions. Um, QRMD currently works with about 35 specialties uh, with you know 100,000 plus users. So we, we work on a specific list of items to help you through ICD-10. And uh, going to the next slide, you'll notice that there's three levels of items we're sort of working on for you. Right? So level one uh, is the ICD-10 Resource Center. Uh, this is, again, available on the CureMD website as well as within the Cure Wiki. You're able to go in and pull uh, details. We're working on a documentation readiness assessment uh, that you can contact us about. Uh, we're also putting in all the frequently asked questions on the Wiki and, again, on the website so that you can refer to them. Level two, there's an IC10 pit stop uh, physician training program that started and we're through two sessions of the four that are scheduled for this training program with you as of today. Uh, we're going to help you convert codes. So there is, uh, or you do have the ability to come to us with your top 30, 40 ICD codes and we'll help you convert those to ICD-10 and build a cheat sheet or checklist uh, based off of that. There's also a role-based checklist that's available on our website as of today where you can, you know, divide sort of what needs to be done for ICD-10 between different members of your practice and maybe work on a project plan. And lastly, of course, are going to be those expert Q&A sessions that we're going to have with you. Uh, we have an ICD-10 consultancy program and you can contact us at ICD10Consultants at QRMD.com to get details. QRMD is ICD-10 ready. Uh, we're rolling out uh, right now. We we have some clients who are actively using ICD-10. You guys have the ability to map your codes, of course. And we're going to take you through that. So rest assured, we're well prepared. Uh, we're ready to help you. And of course, going further, um, you know, these, these, the biggest items that we have are, of course, the Q&A sessions. And we, we realize that during these webinars, we don't 
always have the time to address your questions. So we're noting every single one of them. We'll answer every single one of them, and we'll be addressing your concerns during our follow-up sessions. So thank you so much for all our attendees uh, for attending. Uh, thank you to Dr. Williams for the excellent session. Uh, we hope to see you again next week for part three, ICD-10 code selection strategies. As always, we're doing our best, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you.